Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is ConAgra Foods, ticker CAG. I believe it's now known as ConAgra Brands. So ConAgra Brands, ConAgra Foods. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, this company has a market cap of $16 billion, enterprise value of $24 billion. So you see about an $8 billion of debt on this business, which is providing some incremental leverage so that you can have a higher return on equity than your return on invested capital. Operating in the food products industry, they provide consumer packaged goods, food in North America for segments, grocery and snacks, refrigerated, frozen, international and food service. So shelf stable food products, regular refrigeration um, through various retail channels. <coughs> Of an international segment. It looks like food services, customized food products, including meals, entrees, sauces um, for restaurants and other food services. Um, has the brands Bird's Eye, Duncan Hines, Healthy Choice, Marie Callender's, Ready Whip, Slim Jim, um, Boom Chicka Pop, Dukes, Earth Balance, Gardein, and Frontera brands. Again, f branded food products tend to be a fairly good industry, fairly stable, fairly defensive. And that's supported again by the beta of 0 0.60. That's fairly low for an S&P 500 company. S&P 500 company average is 1. And so 0 0.60 means it's relatively less volatile than the S&P 500. Tends to mean it's a relatively higher quality company. Not always, but it's one factor to consider. Next, return on invested capital. Now, what I don't like here is I see two years of losses in the last 20 years. That means you have 18 years of profits, two years of losses. Now, my threshold for what I'd like to see in a quality company is 19 or 20 years of profits, and this is one short. So instead of only having zero or one year of loss, they have two years of losses. So instead of being a high quality company, it's tending towards being an average based upon what I'm seeing so far. The other thing I like to see is I want to see this return on invested capital number above 10%. And and you can see that for most of the last two decades, it's been below 10%. We can see that there are one, two, three, four years that it's been above 10% and only barely 10, 11, 10, and 10. So only barely above 10% when it does hit above 10% and the 10 year median return is a 5% return. That's quite low for me. It's not something that's going to keep me super interested and excited. I really want higher numbers for companies that I'm investing in. So again, another sign that it's a relatively average company. In order to have that 10 to 20% return on invested capital, you need to be relatively high quality and they're just not hitting it right now. With that said, they're clearly leveraging debt well because they're using return on invested capital, they're turning a 5% return on invested capital into an 11% return on equity. Now, I like to see a return on equity of 15% plus. You only get to 11.5% here. So for me, that's not, again, not very interesting. Everything here in the median returns is telling me this is an average company. Return on invested capital, average company, despite operating in a good business, high quality industry, they're clearly not executing to what I would like to see. With that said, valuation, you see a PE ratio here of 19. So not only are you an average company, you're paying an above average price. PE of 19 is above average. Historically, the S&P 500 has been about 15, 16 times earnings. You're trading 19 times earnings, so you're paying an above average price for this company. What do you get for that? Well, you're getting a below, an average company and you're getting negative growth. This is negative revenue growth. So the company is getting smaller over time and you only have an earnings yield of 5% plus, you know, somewhere between 5 to 6% um, earnings yield. That's actually quite terrible for a revenue that's declining. And let's look at what that really shows. In 2013, you had a revenue of 13 billion. 2022, you had a revenue of 11 and a half billion. So you've lost $2 billion in revenue over the course of the decade. That's actually quite terrible. And it looks like it was worse than that, actually. It looks like you bottomed here in 2017. You lost a significant portion of the business, and then they've managed to grow back some. But even with that growth back growth, they're worse off than they were a decade ago. Now, I do see that the earnings per share, it says is a 5% growth, but it's a little surprising because in 2013, you earned $1.85 and in 2022, you earned $1.84. So basically flat earnings per share growth. You've had a decade and no value has been created here. Um, that's not good for long-term shareholders. Now you have had dividends paid out that whole time. It looks like about $10 in dividends over the last decade. So that's all the value you're getting is you're getting the value of a dividend, $10 in dividends, you have a dollar, um, 25 in dividends. So you're getting maybe a 3% dividend yield. Your whole return in this company looks like it's going to be your dividend yield because you're not getting growth. So 
if a 3% return is good for you, then maybe this is an interesting company for you. But if you want a higher return, if you want double digit returns, 10, 12, 15% returns, you're probably going to have to look for another company. If you're enjoying this video so far, hit that like button. If you like my content, I'd love for you to like every one of my videos that you're watching because that tells YouTube that you're enjoying my content. And if you do enjoy my content like that, you need to be a subscriber. Subscribe, ring that bell so you can get notified as I upload new videos each and every week. Right now I'm trying to hit one up Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, putting out three new stock reviews a week. And so if you want to be part of that, you need to be a subscriber. Help me to grow my channel. Let's keep on going. So income statement. So on our income statement, we can see they are paying a decent amount of net interest income. It's about 20% of their operating profit, of course, paying that interest in order to leverage their balance sheet. But it seems like it's a good use. Now, what I do like to see here is, so they've had a decline in gross profit. But what they've done, managed to do is they've taken more of their SGNA out than their gross profit. So they've actually managed to grow their operating profit. That's impressive. That's a really impressive way of managing the business. And it's what's allowed them to have a larger business today. Now, unfortunately, we now see a sign of some negative capital allocation here because the business is just simply not returning that much. They've had to dilute shareholders in order to simply maintain this company. You see that they started the decade with 411 million shares outstanding. They end it with 480. You've had about a you know, 17%, 18% dilution over the course of a decade. That's simply not appealing to me as a potential investor. So that's a, that's a negative sign for them as a potential investor. Now, PP&E is basically flat, 2.7 billion to 2.7 billion. Hasn't really changed, but you can see that they've had to make some acquisitions in 2018, 2019, because your goodwill jumped up by $7 billion here. You also went up by about $3 billion in other intangibles. So that's where this big growth in um, assets has gone. You basically doubled your assets with that acquisition. Which is unfortunate because you didn't really increase your income by doing that, which which is a big concern. Um, you do have some stock-based compensation. Again, that's leading to that dilution over time. Um, and you're not being able to offset that with its with buybacks. So it is a bit of a concern, especially when you have a few years like 2019 with a big issuance of stock, big issuance of debt. Of course, that's used for this acquisition, but it's something to be aware of that that's coming in pretty heavy there um, on the cash flow statement. So for me, ConAgra Foods is just simply not interesting. You have an average company, average quality. Um, you have average capital allocation, paying a dividend, diluting shareholders. That's all average. It's not terrible. It's not great average, um, average return on investments. Um, but you're paying an above average price and you're paying worse than average. Most companies actually manage to at least grow some, but this business is declining. And so for me, I think ConAgra is in a void. I would not be interested at all in this company. And so I will pass on it going forward. If you enjoyed this content, please hit that like that button. If you want to catch my future videos, you need to be a subscriber. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell. You can get notified as I upload new videos each and every week. Three videos, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you want to see the past videos I've covered on the S&P 500, I've already put in over 100 videos covering different S&P 500 companies. You need to look at the playlist that will come up shortly about the S&P 500 playlist of stocks. So, if you enjoy this tool that I'm using to do the analysis, it is at quickfs.net. You can subscribe straight from the recommendation link that I have in the show notes. It's quickfs.net slash tray something. And that is my affiliate link to let them know that I was the one that recommended it to you. You can sign up for free or you can sign up for a paid plan. They have both. And I would just really appreciate if you use my link. That's a good way to support the show if you're enjoying the content I'm producing here on YouTube. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.